Welcome to Straight Scripture, No Sugar. This is a Bible sermon series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God. Father, sanctify them in truth. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. John 8, 31 and 2. If you abide in me and abide in my word, then truly you are my disciples and you'll know the truth. And the truth shall make you free. Proverbs 35. Every word of the Lord proves true. He is a shield to those who take refuge in him. Deuteronomy 34. Uh, 32 4 for he is a rock and all of his ways are justice a God of truth and without injustice righteous and upright is he so both the Old Testament and the New Testament state the fact that the Word of God is in fact truth when you have truth you have an absolute to build your life on as opposed to the shifting sands of the culture, the shifting sands of the human opinion, where everybody's right in their own eyes, and there are no absolutes. There's a reason scripture also says in 1 Corinthians 3.19 that wisdom of the world is foolishness with God. Well, the reason it's foolish is because there are no absolutes and everybody's right in their own eyes. That's why you do want the absolute of scripture to guide your life. You want the truth of the word of God and that's why this series is devoted exclusively to the Word of God, and it's called Straight Scripture, No Sugar. So today's sermon message brings forth a massive contrast between worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. Worldly wisdom and godly wisdom. Worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. Now, just by the introduction, you can already tell which one is going to win out, but this is going to get into the details of worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. So without further ado, I am going to get into the book of Job here, and here is Job, a man who, according to God, was blameless and upright, that there was nobody like him in all the earth. That's God's own testimony about Job from the first chapter of Job, okay? When uh, the devil challenges God about Job himself and his righteousness, okay? Now, the situation with Job is he was a man who was great, very, very great. In fact, he was the wealthiest man in the east, the scripture says, he had thousands of camels, oxen, sheep, donkeys, okay? He had 11,000, okay? He was the greatest man in the east in terms of wealth. And according to God, he was blameless and upright, and he was fearing God and turning away from evil. Yet, this huge, horrible tragedy befell him. That was among the greatest tragedies that anybody had ever experienced, okay? He lost everything. He lost all of his cattle. He lost seven sons and three daughters, all right? He lost his health. His body was covered in sores, and he had to scrape off his sores with shards of broken pottery, okay? He went through horrible, horrible trial and tribulation, arguably among the greatest trials and tribulations that anybody suffered in the Bible, okay? But he was being tested, all right? He was being tested. This was a test that God put him through to prove to the devil the power of saving faith, okay? And despite all the suffering that Job went through and everything that he lost, he never once sinned with his lips or blame, blamed God for any of his adversity. And ultimately, he was blessed twice as much. He was blessed with twice as much as he had before. And he lived 140 years after his trial. And he died old and full of days. Nevertheless, when Job is in the midst of these horrible trials, and he's lost everything, okay? And his body is covered in sores. And he has lost all of his uh, flocks. He's lost all of his cattle. He's lost everything that he has. His seven uh, sons and three daughters. He's got a wife who's telling him to curse God and die. Okay, he is, he is in the low of abject misery, the ultimate low of abject misery. And he has 
a series of friends who come and try to comfort him and give him reason as to why he's going through all this horrible suffering. Their names were Eliphaz, Bildad, Zophar, and Elihu. But anyway, Job doesn't have any answers for all of this horrible, horrible suffering that he's in the midst of, okay? And he's trying to reason his way through this. And here's the conclusion he comes to in Job 28, all right? We're getting into the crux of human wisdom or worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom. Here's what he says in Job 28. But where can wisdom be found? In other words, he's looking for an explanation for all of his profound suffering. He can't find it. But where can wisdom be found? And where is the place of understanding? Man does not know its value, nor is it found in the land of the living. Job 28 verses 12 to 13. Okay, and now I'm going to go on with Job 28, 14 to 22 to get into more detail on this. The deep says it is not in me, and the sea says it is not with me. It cannot be purchased for gold, nor can silver be weighed for its price. It cannot be valued in the gold of Ophir, in precious onyx or sapphire. Neither gold nor crystal can equal it nor can it be exchanged for jewelry of fine gold. No mention shall be made of coral or quartz, for the price of wisdom is above rubies. The topaz of Ethiopia cannot equal it, nor can it be valued in pure gold. From where then does wisdom come? And where is the place of understanding? It is hidden from the eyes of all living and concealed from the birds of the air. Destruction and death say, we have heard a report about it with our ears. God understands its way and he knows its place. Job 28, 23. All right, so Job makes it quite clear. You cannot find wisdom, true wisdom, the wisdom that counts in the land of the living. You cannot purchase it with gold. You cannot purchase it with precious gems or stones, okay? It can't be found in the land of the living anywhere, okay? And death says, I have heard of it. So even death knows nothing about wisdom. So nothing in the human realm, in human experience, can provide the necessary wisdom that man needs to understand, okay? So what is his ultimate conclusion? This wisdom comes from God, okay? It comes from God, okay? True understanding comes from God. It cannot be found in the land of the living, all right? And to man, he said, behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Job 28, 28, all right? The fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. Well, what does that mean? It means coming under God's guidance, coming under God's truth, coming under God's commandments. That is true wisdom. That is where you are, you're given the answers. That is where you get the understanding that you need to navigate life, all right? So Job ultimately understood that the only answers to his suffering are gonna come from God. They're not gonna come from the world. They're not gonna come from anything in the world, okay? Only God is gonna provide understanding and insight as to why there's so much horrible adversity and trouble and why he had gone through such profound suffering and why he had lost the seven sons and three daughters and his thousands of cattle and his name and reputation and why his body was covered in sores, okay? Only God was going to provide answers and he understood it. He understood it. Now, let's 
Fast forward a few thousand years to King Solomon, okay? King Solomon, who reigned from 970 to 930 BC as the king of Israel, okay? The third king of Israel after Saul and his father David. <clears throat> now Solomon was a man who was basically king when he was very young, okay? He didn't have any much knowledge and understanding and God came to him in a dream in 1 Kings 3 and he asked Solomon, what do you wish for? Solomon said, to discern good and evil and to rule and reign with justice and righteousness. And this greatly pleases God. It greatly pleases God. And because Solomon asks for what pleases God, God says, I'm going to make you the wisest man on earth. And because you have asked for what pleases me, I will also give you what you haven't asked for. I'll give you great wealth and great honor. And if you obey my commands, I'll give you long life. All right. All right. So Solomon becomes the wisest man on earth to the point where all the kings and uh, peoples from all the nations come to learn of Solomon's great wisdom. He knew 3,000 proverbs, 1,005 songs, okay? Nobody can stump him with his great wisdom because it was God's wisdom. I mean, even the Queen of Sheba posed basically every question to him under under the sun, and, and he solved every one of her questions, provided every single answer, okay? And she was basically overwhelmed with his knowledge and understanding, and she praised God for it. So ultimately, God got all the glory for Solomon's wisdom because it was truly God's wisdom, and God was using Solomon essentially as the wisdom witness for his truth, his discernment, his righteousness, his justice, okay? But here's what happens. Solomon, although he has all of uh, God's great wisdom, knowledge, and understanding, he basically becomes consumed with the world and worldly wisdom, okay? God makes him the wealthiest man on earth. He has an annual income of 25 tons of gold, and he indulges himself to the hilt. He also has 700 wives and 300 concubines. This is in 1 Kings 10 and 1 Kings 11, and I'm going to get into that a little more later. But ultimately, Solomon, the man who was the wisest on earth, okay, a man who has divine wisdom, chooses to indulge himself in the world and get caught up in worldly wisdom. Okay, listen to this verse from James. This wisdom does not descend from above, but is earthly, sensual, demonic. James 3.15. That's worldly wisdom. It is earthly, sensual, and demonic, okay? It doesn't go beyond the earth, okay? It doesn't provide ultimate explanations, as Job pointed out. In Job 28, where can, where can a man find wisdom? It's not found in the land of the living, okay? It's sensual, okay? Earthly wisdom has to do with what feels good, looks good, puffs up the pride. That's it. That's it. And it is demonic. Well, what exactly does that mean? Well, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, the God of this world has blinded the mind of the unbelievers, so they cannot see the light of the gospel, which is the glory of Christ, okay? So basically, the devil essentially blinds the mind of unbelievers, and all they can see is what looks good, feels good, and puffs up the pride, okay? They cannot see the light of the gospel. They can't see the wisdom of God, okay? Now, Solomon could see it, but he basically closed his mind to it and became consumed with the world, and things became futile and hopeless, okay? So I'm going to examine this contrast between worldly and godly wisdom, worldly versus godly wisdom, by looking at three different things. I'm going to look at work, I am going to look at authority, and I'm going to look at life and death. Now, you could go on for months and years doing studies on the comparisons and contrasts 
between worldly and godly wisdom, but just for the sake of brevity, I'm going to focus on these three areas. So let's look at work, okay? Let's look at work. Now let's look at it through the worldly perspective or what Solomon sees here. All the labor of man is for his mouth, and yet the soul is not satisfied. Ecclesiastes 6, 7. Then I hated all my labor in which I had toiled under the sun, because I must leave it to the man who will come after me. And who knows whether he will be wise or a fool, yet he will, nev yet he will rule over all my labor in which I toiled, in which I have shown myself wise under the sun. This also is vanity. Ecclesiastes 2, verses 18 to 19. Okay, a very worldly, worldly view of work. It's an end in and of itself. All work is for the mouth, yet the soul is not satisfied, okay? You know, you think about work, you do think about a job well done. It provides satisfaction, but it's fleeting. You know, if you get a raise or a promotion, that's great, but the satisfaction is fleeting. You know, it isn't long before you want more money and you want the bigger office, okay? So work does provide some temporal satisfaction, but it ultimately does not satisfy the soul. You just want more. You just want the bigger salary. You just want the bigger office. You just want the greater achievement or the next degree or the next PhD. It's never enough, okay? So that's the worldly perspective, okay? And he also says, all the work that I've done, it's just going to be left to somebody else. Everything I've labored for underneath the sun, and who knows if this person's going to be wise or going to be a fool, okay? What difference does it make, right? If this person's a fool, it's just going to get all squandered. What's the point? All is vanity and a striving after wind, okay? That is a worldly view of work. It's a complete dead end, okay? Now, let's look at the godly view of work. Listen to this from Colossians 3. And whatever you do, do it heartily as to the Lord and not to men, knowing that from the Lord you will receive the reward of the inheritance, for you serve the Lord Christ. Colossians 3, verses 23 to 24. Inheritance. You will receive the reward of the inheritance from the Lord. Okay? Solomon doesn't see any of this in his worldly perspective. Okay? He doesn't see any of this from his worldly perspective, okay? He basically says, work doesn't satisfy the soul, and everything that I do is going to be left most likely to some fool. What's the point? All is vanity and striving after wind, okay? He doesn't see the godly perspective, which is when you work hard and you do your best, okay, it's going to lead to an inheritance in heaven, okay? You're going to get an inheritance from the Lord when you do your best, okay? You're going to get an inheritance from God, okay? And there's even more to it than this, okay? Listen to this from Luke 19. And so it was that when he returned, having received the kingdom, then he commanded these servants to whom he had given the money to be called to him, that he might know how much every man had gained by trading. Then came the first, saying, Master, your mina has earned ten minas. And he said to him, Well done, good servant, because you were faithful in a very little, have authority over ten cities. Luke 19, verses 15 to 17. Okay, so the inheritance that we receive from the Lord as believers for doing our best with our work in this life it's going to be generous beyond measure, okay? We're not just going to have an eternal inheritance, but it is going to be multiplied and compounded. I mean, here we have a servant, okay? The master goes away on business. This is the parable of the minus uh, from Luke 19. The master goes away on the business, and when he comes back, he wants to get an accounting from his servants who he left uh, with provision to see how much they've earned, okay? You have 10 servants, they're each given a mina. A mina is about the equivalent of three months' wages, okay? 
So this faithful servant, he earns 10 minas with this one mina, a thousand percent return on investment. Okay, that is extraordinary, okay? And what happens? The master says, you have been faithful in a few things, so rule over 10 cities. Rule over 10 cities. You were faithful in a very little, have authority over 10 cities. All right, well done, good servant. You know, this, this reward is, is exponential. This uh, reward is compounded beyond measure. I mean, a mine is the equivalent of three months wages, and this servant is going to rule over 10 cities? 10 cities? Wow, that is an inheritance. That is an inheritance that shows the ultimate fruit of labor. Fruit that is compounded and compounded and compounded, okay? This shows God's generosity is incredible generosity. And how much faithful working, hardworking servants are going to reap in eternity, okay? One mina, okay? He takes one mina, the, ter the servant takes one mina, multiplies it 10 times, which is the equivalent of 10 minus, but 10 minus, okay, that would still be only 30 months of wages, which is what, you know, three years or well, 12 times three is 36, a little less than three years worth of wages, all right? Superb return on investment, but when you compare that with what he's gonna rule over in eternity, 10 cities, 10 cities, that's exponentially more. That's exponentially more. What incredible generosity, okay? Let's go on a little further from 1 Peter 1. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who according to his abundant mercy has begotten us again to a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead to an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that does not fade away reserved in heaven from you. 1 Peter 1 verses 3 to 4. Okay, this hard work is going to reap in an internal inheritance, not only an, inter an internal or eternal inheritance that is incredibly, incredibly abundant, okay, abundant beyond measure, beyond anything that we can imagine, but it's imperishable, unfading, okay, and undefiled, okay, it will never go bad. It will never lose its appeal. It'll, it won't be tainted by any sin, and it won't fade away. It'll never lose its appeal, okay? Like these earthly rewards for work, okay? The raise, satisfying momentarily, doesn't satisfy the soul, okay? Um, the promotion, momentarily satisfying, but doesn't offer lasting or permanent satisfaction. It gets old. Okay, everything that you work for, the bigger house or the better car, okay, or the more exotic vacation, those things never hold their value or hold their appeal. They get old, okay? Before long, you want something else. You want bigger, you want quicker, you want faster. They never satisfy the soul. They never satisfy the the soul, okay, their ends in and of themselves, okay? But when you see work from the godly perspective, you realize it's going to lead to this eternal reward, this inheritance that's imperishable, unfading, and undefiled, and is exponentially abundant beyond anything we can, we can even fathom, okay? That's the benefit of godly wisdom, okay? Now let's look at the contrast of worldly wisdom, uh, worldly wisdom versus godly wisdom when it comes to authority. Okay, here's the worldly perspective from Solomon and Ecclesiastes. There is an evil that I have seen under the sun, as it were an error proceeding from the ruler. Folly is set in many high places, and the rich sit in a low place. I have seen slaves on horses, 
and princes walking on the ground like slaves. Ecclesiastes 10 verses 5 to 7. Very, very true. The perversion of authority, the perversion of power, okay? We see this everywhere. We see it in the level of corporations. We see it in the level of government. We see it in the level of private institutions and churches, okay? You have fools in positions of power, and you have the wise and wealthy underneath them, okay? It's completely topsy-turvy and upside down, okay? But that's what happens in a fallen world. If we look at it from a godly perspective, we see the reason why we have this kind of corruption. We see the reason why we have this kind of perversion where fools are in positions of power and the wise and the wealthy are underneath them and it's completely backwards, okay? From a human perspective, there are no answers, okay? There's this corruption and there's this injustice, okay? What does Solomon say? Folly is set in many high places. This is an evil that I have seen. It's an error proceeding from the ruler, okay? As if it were an error proceeding um, from the ruler. But the fact of the matter is the ruler is a fool, okay? But there's no human explanation for it. But there's very much a godly explanation. This is from Isaiah chapter 3. For the look on their faces bears witness against them. They proclaim their sin like Sodom. They do not hide it. Woe to them, for they have brought evil on themselves. Tell the righteous that it shall be well with them, for they shall eat the fruit of their deeds. Woe to the wicked. It shall be ill with him, for what his hands have dealt out shall be done to him. My people, infants are their oppressors, and women rule over them. Isaiah 3, verses 9 to 12, okay? There's a reason authority and power are corrupted. There's a reason fools are in positions of power and folly is exalted and the rich, okay, are on the ground and the slaves are on the horses. It's because of sin, all right? Here Isaiah is predicting ultimately the Babylonian invasion, which is going to come about 150 years later because of Israel's sin. They're flagrantly sinning. They're flagrantly caught up in gross idolatry, which is a violation of commandments one and two. And they flaunt their sin like Sodom, okay? What are we talking about with Sodom? Well, Sodom and uh, Gomorrah were abjectly wicked, evil cities that are uh, described in Genesis 19, all right? flagrant flagrantly wicked homosexual rapists who tried to rape angels they tried to rape holy angels okay they were the epitome of evil okay and god destroyed those cities with fire and brimstone okay so israel is flaunting their sin like sodom they're essentially spitting in god's face and because of that God allows the power structure to be corrupted, where children are in power over them, okay? Children are elevated and exalted in power over them, and women are empowered over them, and everything is topsy-turvy. Everything is upside down and backwards, but it's corrupted because of sin, okay? It's because of sin, and Solomon doesn't see this in his human wisdom. Why are there fools in positions of power? Why is, why is folly exalted, okay? Because of sin. When you see it from the godly perspective, there's an explanation that makes perfect sense, all right? Now, the contrary is, okay, well, that if that can be corrected through obedience and submission to God, all right? Blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord, the people he has chosen for his own inheritance. 
Psalm 33, 12, okay? When a nation comes under God, when a nation fears God and is obedient to God, they are blessed, they are not cursed, and they are empowered, and they are exalted, and they are fruitful, and they are raised up above other nations. I mean, you think about the United States. When the United States was a God-fearing nation, the time of the Second World War, the United States did, did not win the Second World War over Japan and Germany because of superior intelligence and firepower. The United States won because we were a God-fearing nation at the time. We came under God completely. I mean, if you listen to President Roosevelt's uh, D-Day speech from June 6, 1944, it is so filled with pathos and it is so feel, uh, filled with reverence and pleading for God. It, it just brings tears to your eyes, okay? But the United States at the time was a God-fearing nation. We won the war, the United States did, and ultimately God raised the United States to the greatest nation in the world, okay? But that was decades ago. That was decades ago. We are no longer a God-fearing nation, and that's why things are so upside down in this culture. That's why fools and children are in positions of power, because of rebellion against God, because of sin against God. I mean, if you look at uh, the beginning of Deuteronomy 28, when Israel was going in to take the land of the Canaanites, okay, to basically displace these wicked, evil nations, all right? God says, if you obey me, you're going to be blessed. If you disobey me, you're going to be cursed, okay? And among the blessings at the beginning of Deuteronomy 28, all right, what is spoken of, okay? Israel is spoken of as a nation that is going to be the greatest among the nations. That's what God promises. He promises that he's going to put the fear of Israel into the hearts of Israel's enemies. That Israel is going to be the head and not the tail. It's going to be above and not beneath. The work of Israel's hands is going to be blessed. They're going to be blessed when they go out. When they come in, he's going to bring the rains and he's going to make them abundantly fruitful. Okay, Israel will lend to, to other nations, but will never have to borrow. Okay. God promises blessing above measure for the nations that walk in obedience to him. But if they don't, okay, what's going to happen? Folly and foolishness is going to be exalted above the wealthy and the wise, okay? Solomon can't find an explanation. He just says there's a great evil, okay? Well, he forgets the godly wisdom that this great evil exists, because of rebellion against God and because of sin. Okay, now let's look at the worldly and godly view of life and death. All right, let's go to the worldly view once again from Ecclesiastes. Here's Solomon speaking. I saw that wisdom excels folly as light excels darkness. The wise man's eyes are in his head, but the fool walks in darkness. Yet I myself perceived that the same event happens to them all. So I said in my heart, as it happens to the fool, it also happens to me. And why then was I more wise? Then I said in my heart, this also is vanity. For there is no more remembrance of the wise than of the fool forever, since all that now is will be forgotten in the days to come. And how does a wise man die? as the fool, Ecclesiastes 2, verses 13 to 16. <clears throat> wow, how cynical, how bitter. Well, that's what happens when you're left with human reason and human wisdom only, okay? Basically, it doesn't matter whether you're a fool or you're wise because everybody dies, they both go to the same place, okay? And nobody's going to remember the wise man after he's gone, okay? He starts out saying it's better to be wise than to be a fool because the wise man has light, the fool only has darkness. But, hey, what difference does it make, okay? 
whether you're wise or whether you're a fool, you die. Nobody's going to remember the wise man, just like nobody's going to remember the fool. So it doesn't matter if you're wise, okay? The wise man dies like the fool because nobody's going to remember him, all right? Nobody's going to remember him at all, all right? It doesn't matter. They both go to the same place, all right? That is the worldly view of wisdom versus foolishness, of wisdom versus folly. It doesn't matter because they both die and nobody's going to remember the wise man just like nobody's going to remember the fool, okay? So the wise man, for all of his days of wisdom, he's a fool. He's going to die just like the fool. What difference does it make, right? That is the worldly view. It's a hopeless dead end. Now let's look at the godly view of life and death. Here's Jesus speaking from John 5. Do not marvel at this, for the hour is coming in which all who are in the graves will hear his voice and come forth. Those who have done good to the resurrection of life and those who have done evil to the resurrection of condemnation. John 5 verses 28 to 29. All right. What's the difference between living as a wise man and living as a fool from a worldly perspective? No difference. From a godly perspective, heaven and hell. The fool goes to hell. Would you say that's a difference worth noting? I mean, that's the ultimate difference, right? Eternal torment versus eternal bliss and satisfaction and peace. Gee, which one would you choose, all right? But when you look at it, when you look at life and death from a worldly perspective, it's a big fat dead end that doesn't matter when you look at it from a godly perspective or through the lens of godly wisdom, you realize it is the difference between heaven and hell. It's the difference between heaven and hell. Listen to this. Listen to what Jesus says in Matthew 8. All right, so this is the response to the Roman centurion, who was a man, a Gentile man of great faith, okay? And Jesus commends him here. Listen to this. Assuredly, I say to you, I have not found such great faith, not even in Israel. And I say to you that many will come from east and west and sit down with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. But the sons of the kingdom will be cast out into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Matthew 8 verses 10 to 12. The sons of the kingdom will be cast into outer darkness. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. That's hell. That is hell. Okay. That's where the fool goes. And Solomon doesn't see this. Because he's looking at life and death through the lens of human wisdom. He doesn't see the life to come. Life after death. Okay? And Jesus is saying here, the righteous, okay, the, the wise, they're going to sit down with Abraham and Isaac and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven. All right? They're going to be blessed forever with eternal comfort, eternal satisfaction, eternal peace. An eternal reward but the sons of the kingdom in other words the Jews who are religious hypocrites and aren't truly saved okay they're gonna be sent to hell in other words the ones who live foolishly the ones who live foolishly okay and don't heed the warning of Christ that don't heed the gospel of Christ and submit to it they're gonna be sent to hell okay so, from a godly perspective, when people look at life and death, they realize that the difference between the wise man and the fool is the difference between heaven and hell. But from a worldly perspective, it doesn't even matter, okay? Because there's no understanding in the worldly perspective. There's no transcendent truth, okay? It's all, it's all just what's right before the eyes, what looks good, feels good, and puffs up the pride. There's no ultimate understanding, okay? All right, so in the end, 
There are ultimately two choices. You can go the way of worldly wisdom, or you can go the way of godly wisdom, okay? So, let's look at a few summary statements that Solomon makes about worldly wisdom, okay? That which has been is what will be. That which is done is what will be done, and there is nothing new under the sun. Ecclesiastes 1.9, okay? Bitter, cynical, dead-end, hopeless, worldly wisdom, okay? What is has already been, okay? And what is to come already is. There's nothing new under the sun, okay? That, once again, is a dead-end, worldly perspective. I mean, you look at the way that people who are lost perceive things. They're always in to the newest and latest and greatest thing. That's worldly thinking. It's all about what is new. Well, what is new never satisfies. What is new never fulfills. But that's the limitation of worldly wisdom, okay? It can't see the truth of God. It can't see the true meaning and purpose of life, which is to give God glory. 1 Corinthians 10, 31. Whether you eat, drink, and whatever you do, do it all for the glory of God. And when you do that, and you do it heartily, Colossians 3.23, you'll receive an eternal reward, which is imperishable, unfading, and undefiled, reserved in heaven for you. 1 Peter 1.4, right? But from a worldly perspective, it's just a big dead end. Everything that is, was, what is, will be. There's nothing new under the sun. Worldly thinking. I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed all is vanity and grasping for the wind. Ecclesiastes 1.14, okay? All is vanity, all is worthless, okay? Now Solomon, once again, he was the wealthiest man on the earth, and he was the wisest man on the earth, but he became a prisoner of the world. He says, I have seen everything under the sun, okay? His wealth beyond measure. Let me get into a few details from Ecclesiastes 2 and uh, 1 Kings 10 and 11. Okay. So he built houses, vineyards, gardens. He had parks, fruit trees, pools. He had many male and female slaves, abundance beyond measure. He had the greatest herds and flocks. He had male and female singers. He had 500 shields of hammered gold and an annual income of 666 talents of gold, which is the equivalent of 25 tons of gold of income every year, all right? He had 700 wives and 300 concubines. He also made the house of the forest of Lebanon, in which he had a great ivory throne, which was gilded in gold and flanked by 12 lions, all right? And that's not even the end of it, okay? That's just a sampling of his abundance beyond measure, okay? And he indulged in all of it to the hilt. He indulged in all of it to the hilt. And what did he conclude? I have seen all the works that are done under the sun, and indeed, and indeed all is vanity and a striving after wind. He forgot about God. He forgot about God. He got consumed with the world and worldly wisdom, and worldly wisdom can only understand what looks good, feels good, and puffs up the pride. That's 1 John 2, 16. That's everything that's in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. That's the limitation and the folly of human wisdom, okay? It's a big, fat, dead end, and there's no satisfaction. Now, Let's get into the be-all, end-all of godly wisdom. But the natural man does not receive the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, nor can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. 1 Corinthians 2.14, okay? Now, this refers to a lost person, okay? He or she does not understand the things of God. He he or she cannot understand godly wisdom because their minds are dead in trespasses and sin, okay? Ephesians 2.1, the God of this world has blinded their minds, 2 Corinthians 4.4, 4, okay? So their minds are blind 
to godly wisdom. Now Solomon had godly wisdom, but he chose to close his ears and his eyes to it, okay? So he is essentially, was essentially living like somebody who was spiritually dead, even though he wasn't. He just caught, he just got caught up in the worldly wisdom, okay? But to those who don't confess Christ as Lord, they are like Solomon was, okay? When he decided to close his eyes and close his ears to godly wisdom and get consumed with the ways of the world and human wisdom, okay? The fear of the Lord leads to life and he who has it will abide in satisfaction, Proverbs 19.23, okay? Getting back to Job from Job 28. What is wisdom? To fear the Lord and to turn from evil, okay? That leads to life, and he who has it will abide in satisfaction, okay? So when you submit to God, when you submit to God's truth through his word, you will have true transcendent life, okay? When you know God's wisdom, when you know God's word as opposed to the wisdom of men, okay? You're gonna have guidance for life. You're gonna know how to live. You're gonna know how to serve. You're gonna know how to maximize your life for God's glory and have satisfaction that is transcendent. You will have holy satisfaction that comes from the indwelling Holy Spirit. Love, joy, peace, hope, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control that the world only offers in counterfeit, that the world never offers on a spiritual level. You will have explanations and reasons that are transcendent, okay? You will have reason for suffering and difficulty. You will have reason and explanation for hard work. You will have reason and explanation for the corruption of power and authority. You will have reason and explanation for life, okay, and for wisdom as opposed to foolishness, okay? If you chose, you choose human wisdom, it's just a big, fat, hopeless, dead end, okay? Psalm 32, 8 says, I will instruct you and teach you in the way you should go. I will guide you with my eye. Do not be like the horse or the mule who have no understanding, who will not come without bitter bridle, okay? So when you're in the word of God and you have divine guidance and wisdom, you know how you're supposed to live as opposed to behaving like a horse or a mule who doesn't have any understanding. That is worldly wisdom. No explanation, okay? No explanation. That's why Job said wisdom, true wisdom cannot be found in the land of the living. Man does not have truth. Man does not have explanation. Man does not have transcendent understanding. It comes from God, okay? It comes from God. And his, his word gives us guidance on work. It gives us guidance on relationships. It gives us guidance on spiritual service, how to use our spiritual gifts. It gives us true direction. It gives us protection against sin. It shows us how to triumph over sin. It shows us how to transform our minds so that we be can become holy and righteous instead of defiled and useless. It gives us everything that we need for life and godliness. And not only that, God gives us his Holy Spirit when we confess his Son as Lord to give us the wisdom, the understanding, the power, and the might, okay? So ultimately, at the end of Ecclesiastes, okay, Solomon seems to understand and come to his senses. He understands that the wisdom of God is the only true way to life and everlasting life, okay? Here's what he says at the end of Ecclesiastes. <clears throat> this is at the end of chapter 12. The words of the wise are like goads, and the nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. My son, 
Beware of anything beyond these. Of making many books there is no end, and much study is a weariness of the flesh. The end of the matter all has been heard. Fear God and keep his commandments, for this is the whole duty of man. For God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Ecclesiastes 12, verses 11 to 14. All right, he gets it. He gets it in the end, okay? He gets it in the end, okay? True wisdom, all right? True wisdom is to fear God and obey his commandments, to follow his guidance as the one true shepherd, okay? This one true shepherd through wisdom goads us, okay? The picture here is a shepherd with sheep, <clears throat> the shepherd will go the reluctant sheep and, and move them in the right direction, okay, to not only keep them safe, but to give them provision, okay? The true shepherd, all right, will provide the nails, nails firmly fixed. This refers to, you know, the pen where the sheep would go at night. They're going to be firmly fixed with nails so that the, che uh, the sheep don't get out of the pen and go astray, okay? So the wisdom of God not only protects and provides, but it prevents the believers from going astray, okay? And this wisdom is to fear God and to obey his commandments, to come underneath his guidance and his instruction and his truth, because this leads to ultimate satisfaction, ultimate fulfillment, permanent reward in heaven, fruitfulness in the kingdom, okay? To maximize usefulness for God and to live a life that gives him maximum glory and gives the believer maximum satisfaction, okay? It's a difference between life and death. It's the difference between heaven and hell. It is a difference between truth and lies. The world provides no answers. The world provides no ultimate satisfaction. The world provides no solutions. It's just a big dead end. All is vanity and a striving after wind. But when we, when we look at things through God's lens, we can see truth and reason behind all of it. We can see purpose behind all of it. It's going to lead to blessing. It's going to lead to reward. It's going to lead to understanding. It's going to lead to an inheritance imperishable, unfading, and undefiled, reserved in heaven for you. Okay? But we can't benefit from any of this worldly or godly wisdom rather, we can't truly understand it and plumb its depths for guidance unless we have God's Holy Spirit. Okay, and God's Holy Spirit, Isaiah 11 2, he's the spirit of wisdom and understanding, the spirit of counsel and might, the spirit of knowledge and the fear of the Lord. But we will not receive him to have the fullness of this godly wisdom unless we confess his son Jesus Christ as Lord. And why do we have to do that? Well, because we're all sinners and we're all naturally enemies of God. We're all naturally carnal. We all naturally see things through a worldly lens unless we confess Christ as Lord. And what separates us from this just and holy God is our sin. There's not one righteous, not one. There's not one who understands or, or seeks after God. That's Romans 3.10. So if you've ever lied, cheated, stolen anything, lusted after somebody else's car, house, or wife, I've done it, you've done it, we've all done it, then I'm guilty, you're guilty, we're all guilty of sin before a just and holy God. Isaiah 6, 3, holy, holy, holy is the Lord, okay? He is pure, 100% righteous, and he cannot have sin in his presence. 
We need to be reconciled to him through the man who knew no sin. That's his son, Jesus Christ. Isaiah 53, 5, he was pierced for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. The penalty for our peace was upon him, and by his wounds we are healed. So when we confess Christ as Lord, what happens? 2 Corinthians 5, 21, for our sake he made the man who knew no sin to become sin for us, so in him we might become the righteousness of God. The Son, Jesus, pays the sin debt on the cross. The Father crushes him for the sins of all of confessing humanity before and after the cross. And when the Father looks at the confessor, he sees his perfect Holy Son, who made the perfect sacrifice, and the confessor is saved. Okay? The confessor is saved. Romans 10, 9. If you confess with your mouth, Jesus is Lord. Believe in your heart, God raised him from the dead. You will be saved. Not only will you be saved, but you will receive God's Holy Spirit. I will give you a new heart and a new spirit. And I will take away your heart of stone and give you a heart of flesh and move you to keep my decrees and to keep my laws. That's from Ezekiel 36, okay? Not only that, but you have all of the attributes of the Holy Spirit. Wisdom and understanding, all right? Wisdom and understanding. Godly wisdom, okay? You will have all of this understanding. You will understand the Bible, okay? You will understand it cover to cover. That doesn't mean there aren't parts that are difficult to understand, but you will have the Holy Spirit to give you that understanding, to give you true understanding, which Job says comes from God only, only Will you get understanding? Only will you get true wisdom to maximize your life and to reap maximum rewards in heaven and maximum blessing on this earth. You will only get it through God's Holy Spirit, okay? And that requires salvation and a confession of Christ as Lord. And once you do that, the lights will turn on. You will go from darkness to light. You will go from lies to truth. You will go from hopelessness to ultimate hope, okay? And instead of confusion, you will have understanding and peace. So once again, the series is called Straight Scripture, No Sugar, a Bible sermon series dedicated exclusively to the Word of God you can watch any of these messages online through the URL. It's getbibletruth.com. I say thank you so much for listening. I pray this is a source of great edification for the believer and obviously salvation for the unbeliever. My name is John Parisi. God bless you. Amen.